Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know about active range of movement testing of the knee joint. We're going to be going through the movements you need to test and the key muscles involved in those movements. And after watching this video, you can then go and watch our other video, which is titled Why Test Active Range of Movement, which gives you the full clinical reasoning behind why we do what we do. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing active range of movement on our patient's right and left sides. But of course, in clinical practice, we always want you to do this so you can inform your patient diagnosis. Now, when we're testing active range of movement, there's three things we need to remember. P, Q and R, which stands for pain, quality and range. If you're familiar with P, Q and R, then you can head through to the next stage of the video. If you're not familiar with our P, Q and R, here's a quick recap. So as we have said, when testing active range of movement of any joint, we need to consider P, Q and R. P for pain, Q for quality of movement, and R for range of movement. In terms of pain, if pain is present, we know that there is a dysfunction within this movement, which may be causing our patient's problem, and will likely direct further testing to this area to try and isolate the source of the pain. If pain is not elicited as part of the examination, the therapist can move on to the next stage. For example, if there is no pain on active lumbar spine movements during a hip examination, the lumbar spine can be ruled out of the initial investigation. In terms of quality, good quality indicates that the brain and local tissue are both happy and able to perform the movement. So what does that look like? It means that the patient will look very willing to move and have sufficient power in movement with good control and coordination. If these are lacking during the movement, quality can be questions, and thus likely direct further testing to establish why the movement is of poor quality. For example, weakness, which could be due to a myotomal weakness from a spinal pathology, or a deconditioned muscle from the local area. In terms of range of movement, too much or too little range can indicate a dysfunction within the movement, and could also help us identify the patient's condition. As a therapist, it is always important to use the range values within your movement test as objective markers and for you to compare the specific range values in each treatment session. It is important to note the range at which your patient's pain starts and the range at which the movement ends, as often these two values will be very different. For example, if we only measured the movement at which pain starts, we do not actually know how much range the patient can achieve. Essentially, a lack of range indicates that there is a stiffness or a weakness which is preventing full movement. So now we're going to test active knee flexion. For this test, the patient is in a supine or long sitting position on the plinth. However, if they are in long sitting, make sure they are not tilted more than 45 degrees, as this places the hip joint in more flexion, which can make active knee flexion more difficult for them. As a therapist, we're going to be standing on the same side as the leg being tested, and we're actually looking at the right leg in this video. I'm simply standing on the other side so you can see things more clearly. And it should be noted that we're standing in line with the knee joint so that we can accurately measure the angle of knee flexion attained by the patient. So from here, we're going to ask our patient to actively flex their knee by sliding their heel along the plinth. We can then perform our overpressure. We place one hand are just proximal to the knee joint on the thigh to stabilize the movement. And our other hand can be in a C-shape or in a Pac-Man position, approximately two thirds of the way down the tibia, and we apply our overpressure like so. And the main muscles that are involved in knee flexion are the hamstring muscles, including semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris muscle. However, there is secondary activity from the sartorius muscle, gracilis muscle, popliteus muscle, and the gastrocnemius muscle. So now we're going to look at our P, Q, and R in terms of active knee flexion. In terms of P for pain, there are a great number of different structures that can be affected by knee flexion. For example, the quadriceps and the patella tendon are on a stretch in this movement. P patients may get pain around the patella, uh, particularly if they present with anterior knee pain or patellofemoral pain syndrome because of any 
difficulties that the patella has in tracking through the femoral groove during knee flexion movement. Patients with osteoarthritis will often get pain with knee flexion. And there are a range of different soft tissue structures that can be affected by knee flexion, including the anterior cruciate ligament, the lateral collateral ligament, the medial collateral ligament, or the uh, medial or lateral menisci. And so therefore, in those instances, it's important to determine where the patient is getting their pain to point to you more evidence of injury towards one of those particular structures. Also, um, if patients present with a Baker cyst, the distension of the posterior joint capsule, then knee flexion is going to compress that distended area, and so that may create pain. And finally, as we said, the main active uh, contractile structures in this movement are the hamstrings. So if the patient has a muscle lesion of the hamstrings, that may create pain in the active movement. So next, we consider the quality of movement. And the reason that we ask our patient to slide their heel across the bed when performing the knee flexion movement is that you'll commonly find that patients simply flex their hip rather than flexing their knee. And this is more likely just to be due to a misunderstanding of the movement you're asking them to reproduce. For example, if you just say bend their knee, they may, real, they may well recreate that movement. In some instances, for example, if they have a dominance of the hip flexor muscles, they may do this as well. So basically, correct your patient and ask them to slide their heel along the bed so you can be sure. And then in terms of range of movement, Text may vary, but the most common uh, feature you'll often see for range of movement is between 0 and 130 to 135 degrees. You may find that patients with osteoarthritis cannot quite achieve this kind of range. Patients with a total knee replacement will commonly only be able to flex to around 90 degrees of knee flexion. And as we said, for all manner of reasons that uh, a patient may report pain, these may also be restricting range of movement. So now we're going to look at active knee extension. And the patient and the therapist in this test are in the same positions as we were for knee flexion. Just to remind you, I'm standing on the opposite side to the leg being tested, just so you can see the video more clearly. So from here, we're going to ask our patient to slide their heel down towards the end of the bed and then squash their knee down into the bed for active knee extension. From here, we can provide our overpressure. We have one hand proximal to the knee joint, resting on the quadriceps. And it's important to note that this hand is definitely not on the knee joint, so that we don't compress the joint during the overpressure. Our lower hand is going to be placed approximately two-thirds of the way down the tibia, with our fingers looping underneath and onto the posterior aspect of the lower leg. To, to provide our overpressure, our lower elbow is going to be locked in place, and our overpressure is in a slow, firm movement like so, where the therapist leans towards the patient's head in order to bring the knee into more of an extended position. And it's important to note the muscles that are active during this movement, which are the quadriceps muscles, including rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. So now we're going to look at P, Q, and R in terms of active knee extension. And first, P for pain. So in this position, it's more likely that your osteoarthritic patient will present with pain. It's also common to experience pain around the patella because of the compression of the patella within the femoral groove. Also consider the hamstrings, which are on a stretch during the extension, so any pain there may be due to this issue. Next, in terms of quality of movement. It's normally that likely that the patient will be able to perform the movement correctly if you use the command to squash their knee down into the bed. However, you may look at the patient's lumbar spine position. It may change if your patient is trying to use excessive hip extension to try and recreate the knee extension movement. So that's something to look out for. 
Finally, in terms of range, the range varies from a 130 degree flex position right down to zero degrees, where flat, uh, in this instance, would equate to zero degrees. You may find your patient is unable to achieve the full movement, uh, especially for osteoarthritic patients uh, who are suffering with pain into knee extension. And also, it is important to know any hyperextension, which may occur if you have a patient who is hypermobile. So to summarise this video on active range of movement of the knee joint, complete your assessment of active range of movement of the patient's knee by looking at active knee flexion and extension. Make yourself familiar with the different patient and therapist positions, the method of applying overpressure, as well as the muscles that are involved in each active range of movement test. And when completing your active range of movement testing, Look for P, Q and R, pain, quality of movement and range of movement. And that completes our video on active range of movement testing for the knee joint. In clinical practice, you would now compare your patient's active range of movement to the passive range of movement of the knee joint. And this should allow you to decide whether or not it is most likely to be active contractile or non-contractile structures which are at fault for their symptoms. You can then use your other clinical tests to clarify your patient diagnosis. Furthermore, you can also look at our videos titled Why Test Active Range of Movement and Why Test Passive Range of Movement for even more information about these tests. Thank you as always for joining us. We'll see you again soon right here on Clinical Physio.